Hi, this is Damon Pistolka, host of the Faces of Business, where I talk with interesting people sharing life and business experiences to entertain, engage, build community, and provide information to help others succeed. If you're interested in learning more about one of our guests or how we are helping business owners generate wealth and build businesses they can sell or succeed at Exit Your Way, you can find more information on our website, ExitYourWay.com, or by contacting me directly, Damon, at ExitYourWay.com. I hope you enjoy the show. All right, everyone. Welcome once again to the Faces of Business. I am your host, Damon Pistolka, and I am excited for our show today because with me, I have none other than Matt Haney, and we're going to be talking about building a leadership team for your exit. Matt, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So happy to be here and um, fired up to talk about this stuff today. I get excited. Oh, yeah. It's it's going to be fun, dude. It's going to be fun. We got We got lots of stuff to go over. And it's, you know, I always love it when I get to talk to people that have actually been through a business exit. You got some scars, I'm sure, from that, learnings, things like that. And then also, you know, your background, and, and we'll talk about this more, is, is being now as you're doing a fractional COO or an interim COO and, a, and an EOS integrator. I mean, there's just so much for us to talk about today. I'm excited to get going. But let's start out with your background. Let's learn a little bit more about Matt and how you got where you are today and doing what you're doing. Awesome. Well, again, thanks for having me, Damon. Excited to, to chat through it. So um, I was fortunate to, to be uh, right out of college. A, an entrepreneur um, gave me a, an analyst job. I begged him uh, to, to work for a, a family office that was buying single family real estate. And I was able to work under an entrepreneur, got a finance background, spent some time at Arthur Anderson for years. And he basically just said, hey, come in, learn. I'll teach you as long as you show up, give it, you give it your all and uh, you're honest and equitable. And, and then you, you got it. So I spent a couple of years with him as an analyst and then moved up into basically buying single family assets for a family office. We bought 350 single family homes in the state of Texas over a three year period. And I got this entrepreneurial bug and I was like, wow, I can I can do this. This is something that I can actually yeah. do. Um, this guy gave me a chance and um, and I turned that into the next entrepreneur. Well, I found myself working next to visionary leaders that had big ideas, but just really struggled to kind of get it to the next step. Um, one of them gave me a, a partnership opportunity in a, in a, in a job that I, I was able to, to then and, and um, we created this niche construction company where we were building large volume water storage systems, these big, huge water silos that you see on the side of the road, not the yeah. ones in the air, but the ones on the ground that store water for municipal yep. systems. And I know nothing about large volume water storage, um, but I knew operations and I knew how to help manage people. Um, and if you gave me the the path um, or the idea, I could take it. So just a couple different on real business things, one led to the next, next, but there was always one common theme. And I was working alongside somebody who had a big vision. Um, and they were very good at, at, at dreaming it up, but had some just element of execution that they couldn't quite get to. Um, and I found my niche and, and a, as a COO and then, you know, kind of parlayed that into an interim opportunity where I was going in and working for uh, the same vision, visionary types, but with, you know, confined uh, accomplishments and goals and metrics to, to work mm -hmm. towards. So. Um, you know, just a lot of small to medium sized businesses figuring it out as we go, Damon. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's what most people do. Honestly. I mean, you look at very few people, you know, I, I don't know who starts a company and doesn't just get in and figure it out. Right. <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, the internet stories would tell you that there's some playbook for all of it, but in reality, yeah. until you've missed a payroll or until you've had somebody, not show up and you have to shovel the muck the day, then you just, you don't know. You don't know what it's like. That is so funny. I had someone ask me today and I'm, I'm actually going to see if I can see it. They said, uh, they asked me the, uh, would, would love to know if you've got any advice for someone that's starting out building a business. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, where do you want to start? <laughs> yeah. Where do you want to start? Cause because you know it it is like that and and it it really there's there's um 
you know, it does take someone with that idea, that idea yeah. that they know that, you know, they've got, they at least think that that's something they can make money on. And I, I got to really commend those visionaries that, that take that leap off the cliff and build the plane on the way down because it is incredible. It is incredible. Um, you use that plane analogy. I mean, I'd say that at least once a week now, Hey, remember we're, the airplane's flying and we're still bolting on things and we're still figuring out what navigation equipment we're using, but it's flying. Don't, don't lose sight of the fact that we're in the air. Um, yeah. and, and visionaries tend to, Oh, there's should be this way or that way, or that way. It's like, I use a term that I, I laugh every time I say it. And I've said it a million times. Functionally functional. Yeah. The business is functioning. Things are going the right direction. Yes, we might be dysfunctional, but we're functioning. We're operating. The business is profitable. Metrics yeah. look good. Stop being so hard on yourself. Yeah. So it's uh, Well, and that's true. that I tell you that this is one thing, an interesting thing I read this week that's kind of uh, on a tangent, but it talked about visionaries and entrepreneurs in, in specific and said that we are the biggest group of people that are, as a group, we're very unhappy because we always measure ourselves against the ideal rather than how much we've gained. Yes, yes. <laughs> I it's was like, like <laughs> yeah, progress, not perfection. I mean, I have every cliche in the world and uh, yeah. I used to frown at cliches. Now, uh, I'm sure people tell you I like to use them just because they're so, they're, they're so true. They're so true. Yes. 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 I mean, it just as you said there, it's like, oh yeah, we're not doing this. We're not doing that. But look behind us and look at how big of a boat that we've got and how, how many things are going right. So that's right. That's awesome. awesome. But uh, never where you came from, right? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Good stuff. So when you were in and when you did that first exit, what did you learn as you were going through and buyers were, were talking and doing those kind of things? What did you learn about leadership team requirements from the buyer's perspective? I'm going to, I'm going to back up because I think before my first exit, I got to witness somebody else exit as. Oh, good, good, good. Even and that better. was interesting. Yeah. So it was 2013. I was working for a products company. Uh, um, director level at that time and, and part of the leadership team early employee it's a consumer package good a fitness product and a typical big visionary ceo um and i got to see him starting to get courted by private equity um mm -hmm. and people looking to roll up a series come together and i wasn't on the executive team but i kind of it, it i ended up kind of getting brought into the fold as they start, as the private equity companies start pulling back the layers of the onion, they want to know what's this look like and how's this and what's yes. that. Well, they they confided in me because I could deliver details around the business. Well, they I yes. kept like, man, ask asking all these questions, asking all these questions, and I'm thinking, you know, and I'm young at this point. I don't really know what I should and shouldn't say. Oh shit. Um, so I I, yeah. I probably shared a little too much, but you start to realize what's important, and they want to know where the skeletons are. They yes. want to know where things are missing, what systems are broken, where we've skimped, where the real problems are. Um, and that just goes to show you to ask your question about my second exit, my my first personal exit, but the second one I was involved in. Every single question they asked the private equity company during that due diligence period, they went around and used against the visionary because yes. that was their ammo for devaluing some piece of the business. Yeah. Um, and th that, so that was like the first time I got to see all this and I didn't have any exposure or any, you know, downside to this thing. I was just making some cash on this big deal on this, yeah. on this business. And so that really framed my mind. It's like, okay, if I ever see this again with my own company, I'm going to go in knowing what somebody, a potential buyer or private equity is going to ask. And by the way, they got all the same questions. Yes, they do. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and I tell you what, the funny thing is about, I was just talking to somebody today, one of our most popular blogs on our website for over three years has been, what is it, something like? how to get bought by a private equity company or something like that, or what private equity companies look for. And it goes through the list. Oh yeah. It goes through the same thing. Cause it's all the same. And, and the funny thing about it is just like you said, the owners, the visionaries can have a, a highly successful, highly profitable business 
that doesn't look very good to a private equity buyer for a number of reasons. Yeah. And knowing what they're going to ask or the buyer's perspective yes. is so critical. It's huge. And if you could even look into that crystal ball of critical, you know, critical mass, learning at three years for your ideal time is the, yes. is the, that's the secret weapon. It's like, and a lot of visionaries, I see a lot of folks that I typically work with aren't looking for a, you know, oh, I've got, I want a, a 5X multiple of EBITDA in seven years. They're like, hey, I want to structure this one to get it better. But if you were looking for that number and you did have that vision of what your exit looked like, then we could work backwards into it and set systems and process and people so that you're set up for that. Um, so yeah. uh, to your point, private equity has a certain thing. And it's frankly, just be an educated buyer that's got a little bit of pocket change or good access to a, you know, SBA loan. There's somebody advising them. There's yeah. some banker or somebody telling them what to go. Yes. Um, and my work tends to be around, uh, my passion tends to be on early team development and, and really helping um, business owners build leaders. And I was fortunate to have somebody invest in me and become the leader. I try to give that back as much as I can. Yeah. Yeah. So... You're right. The three to five year exit or not three to five year timeline and thinking about where you want to be in reverse engineering. I mean, that's what we do. That's what we do in our company. And we're usually working with buyers that do, you know, you figure out, hey, we're worth five million today. We want to sell for whatever, eight, 10, 20, sure. whatever the heck it is. And and, you know, then you you reverse engineer it, like you said. But that three to five year window allows you to really understand who is going to buy? That's because right. when we were in private equity running companies, when we bought that company and we knew where the heck we were going to sell it or had a pretty good idea, we knew the value that we had to get to and we knew what we had to do. And that was the thing that I really learned that I hadn't seen in private, the other non-investor owned businesses before right. was the fact that you just go really never thought about the fact that I'm, I'm increasing value in something like it's, it's, it's like a commodity that we're raising the value somehow by improving it or whatever we're yeah. doing. And it just, it was born to me because I'd worked in family companies before that. And, you know, that's just that's a family company or privately held mostly are just income generators, right? Absolutely. They really don't think about the, the asset, the terminal value of that business. And that perspective, when you put that terminal value hat on, and, and then understand the buyer, the way the buyer is going to look at it. It's a completely different thing because we'll go into businesses that are making a million dollars a year, which is awesome, right? Yeah. Awesome. Yep. I don't think anybody would be pissed about making a million no, dollars a year. Great. But when you look at it and say that's four, five, six, whatever million dollar exit value, they go, well, that's not very good. <laughs> and, and, go, and it's it's the truth because uh, you know values math it's it's right. what what gives you a return on all are that. you seeing are you seeing in that million dollar you know family owned privately held business is that generally a you know a, 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 a an acquirer that's like a general business operator i mean private equity's not looking at stuff that's that small are they are you no, they, I guess they aren't yeah. they aren't unless you unless you're lucky enough to have an, an add-on that you know you could fit into a platform really good. Right. A roll up of some sort. A really of, yeah. good fit for a roll up into, yeah. into that platform with them they've already got. That's that's where we see those going. And really, those you won't get you, you won't get quite the value usually. You can, you can. Sometimes you get a little better because it could be a nice strategic fit. Sure. Um, but still they're financial buyers and you and you will find better. A, a little better value from a strategic, uh, straight up strategic buyer uh, sometimes, but yeah, it, it it is a yeah. The markets are interesting too, and and the markets recently are even more interesting with the interest rates changing and, and stuff right. like that because that's, that's multiple expensive, expensive debt all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah, I got a lot different, but you you let's back up though because sure. I I got off on something else. Yeah, you were talking about starting talking about. Too. Leadership. You're talking about right. leadership, leadership teams. So let's get back to that. That's sure. What we're here to talk about is, is, you know, building that leadership team for your exit. What did you learn in this, these processes by looking at that? So the biggest uh, thing I've found is, is, is in consulting and operating my own businesses as well. It's 
just make you're placing the appropriate amount of value on what we what I call that leadership level. That could be a director, VP, could be a manager, whatever it is. Um, and investing in that that level of people is important is because they're the ones um, that uh, carry the water, as we say. Um, and they're going to be the ones that are going to be in the business once you're out of the business. Um, that's the important thing that I really, I learned myself and I will brag on myself for one second that the leader that I put in my business for uh, 2018 is when I sold it. So it was that five years later, he's grown the business exponentially. Um, the, for me is an absentee owner. And um, he's done a great job of taking care of the individual that we put in the business. But my whole point with that is if you put the right leadership level, you're going to make your exit and your transition a hell of a lot easier because the yeah. buyer is going to come in and go, who is this person? What are their skills? How long have they been in the industry? And what level of um, you know depth do they add to the business? Right? Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you an example. Um, taking somebody who's a good operator, maybe they know how to good and they manage operations, but they lack financial acumen. Yeah. Put them in a finance course. Yeah. Get them a certificate. Teach them about PL. Invest them because you know what? Comes knocking on the door and says, Oh, this guy's managed or gal's managed PL. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've managed it together for the last 24 months. He or she is perfectly capable of running business in the event that I get hit by a bus or you buy my business. Yes. And, and that is the, that is the thing that I, I was fortunate early in my career. I worked for the first investment owners I worked for. They did just that. They, they sent me away to like school, like two or three times on finance. I'm, I got a hard head. It yeah. took a little while, <laughs> but, and, and then they actually invested in a mentor for me Love for it. an entire year. Love it. And, and I cannot, tell you the difference that that made when you think about my abilities before that yes technically i could i could walk through a, a business i could do sure but when you change that to now i can walk into a boardroom and say we did this and it caused that and this is why these numbers are like this is Huge. now i'm starting to talk like the the financial people and the investors so they understand what we're doing yep that's exactly right. And and the, the the thing you said that hit with me was um, you mitigated the buyer's risk by being yes. educated. And it's in any little incremental uh, de-risking of the transaction you can do gives that buyer more comfort in their multiple and um, more comfort in you know the validity of the business. And educating and growing and investing in your leadership team only makes you, uh, the seller, uh, look more... Um, now, what's the word? I guess wise is probably the easiest way to say it. But um, if you put your what would I look for in a business if I was buying hat on, then you'd look for somebody that's got a leadership team that's been developed and is um, ideally reporting on metrics. This is what we spend a lot of time on as uh, fractional COOs is building an operating system like you would for a computer. We build this operating system for the business. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means... We're going to have, like we said, three years of operating metrics that we mm -hmm. can go to this to the buyer and say, look, we've been tracking these metrics for the last three years. Here's our scorecard. Here's our profitability. Here's the volatility. We had an issue here because of this. You can talk to it. So building that structure and having a leadership team that can that can run the structure is huge. Yes. Yeah. And, and let's talk about that for a minute. And I, I will I will segue into what you were just talking about. Sure. One of the things that we saw when we did that uh, in the times that we've we've done that is when you put those scorecards in place and you demonstrate over time that we are setting goals and achieving goals, then when you say and this is where we're going. And that's up, down, wherever you're saying you're going. People and investment buyers will tend to believe you because of your historical. But if you right. don't have that in place, you said three years of, of information. And when you can have three years of we laid out a budget, we laid out operating goals, and we hit that, we surpassed it, we got close, whatever it is, 
they're going to be able to use that as an indicator going forward. Because if I say I'm going to Alaska and the last time I said I was going to Australia, I didn't make it Australia or even close. They, you know, wonder if you're going to make it to Alaska. You Absolutely. Know? So, Absolutely. And that is I'm so glad you said that because it is it, it literally it can be 25, 30 percent more. Absolutely. For the price of your company going out because they will believe that that uh, yeah. growth if will continue if you've demonstrated it's going just like it has before. Absolutely, and then even one step more to to understand around. Um, let's say you're positioning your business for you know a, a strategic acquisition or somebody that that um, has a, a growth growth idea, not just hey we're going to operate and increase this incrementally. Mm -hmm. If you can evidence that and show that by what you've done, oh, we opened a new category, opened a new yeah. geography. Oh, well, what'd you do? We spent this much money and we measured just that piece of it, right? Yeah. And we did it on a shoestring budget. Oh, well, how successful were you? Well, we grew this much. It took us this long. Da, 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 da. Well, then the buyer's going to say, well, but he only put $50,000 into that. What if we put $250,000 and go open up four other states? Well, here's yes. the blue we did and we, we, we've, we've, evident, we've like documented it. And here was the process. And these are what was, this is what we learned. Like y y people just, if you're in the business every day and you I always put my hand up and you're staring at so much, you don't necessarily have the, 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 yeah. the, the ability to step back and say, what's going to make this thing more bulletproof. Um, yes. That's where we come in and, and love to put guardrails around things and help people be accountable and um, define what success looks like. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's so cool because it, it really is when you do that and and some of the things that we I tell you in the last two years have really changed in our business as growth by acquisition in these smaller, um, you know, million to three million dollar EBITDA companies is going crazy. It was partially driven by interest, but now it's it's really driven by if you take a good company. And, and you get your company set up well and it's growing, but your industry is not growing tremendously. You got a lot of growth by acquisition opportunities if you're set up to do it. And, right. and really um, taking those one to three million dollar companies in EBITDA and turning them into seven to ten million dollar EBITDA companies. That's pretty that's a lucrative spot if you can get in there for the owner's exits. You mentioned something earlier around talking about um, mentorship. Um, a large part of what, to, and this, this ties into building a leadership team that's, yeah. that's ready for scale. A large part of what these, uh, I've found these, is a voice outside of the company. Mm -hmm. um, you would be, you probably wouldn't be, but your viewers would probably be shocked at the level of growth I see in people who get the visionary off the screen or out of the boardroom. Yeah, and that's like oh uh, no, it, it, uh, because what I'm telling you is that most people aren't investing in that leadership talent uh, for mentorship. They're seen as a conduit to getting business done or whatnot. Um, but when when we come in, we give that voice to the leader, and they, and then we start developing them and growing them and and holding them accountable. Sounds like I'm micromanaging it. They just want someone to ask questions of. They want to make sure the direction is clear mm -hmm. um, and giving that voice, be it a mentor or an outsourced COO or your vistage friend that you trust, just yeah. somebody to bounce ideas off of strengthens them and gives them more. Acumen. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. So as you're as you're helping these visionaries now, let's let's talk a little bit about the, you know, you're an EOS implementer. And I know the EOS, EOS makes these terms so confusing. The integrator, which is M, is the CO implementer, ah. is the person that sets up EOS. Yes. So we run EOS every day as an operational framework with our companies, but we are COOs, uh, experienced chief operating officers, um, and and that's what that's what we do as fractional integrators. Such a yes. confusing term. Excuse me, integrator. No, it's fine. No, no. I always get, I always say So do I. I've, I've either, either way. Uh, so now explain how you've seen EOS or a business operating system change the way the trajectory of a business 
and the leadership teams in it. Absolutely. Well, first, I want to give a disclaimer. I don't make money off of EOS. I, I don't pay EOS. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't monetize myself off EOS. And I think yep. because this is right for every company. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it has holes, but I think just like AD twenty rule on everything else, eighty percent of it's fantastic. Yeah. So what I will tell you is um, accountability is a dirty word sometimes, but for me, it's not. Uh, yes. because what I've seen firsthand myself is the onset of the word accountability brings fear, but the, yep. and, and, and cause it's the element of the unknown, right? But the long-term value and benefits of that accountability are exponential because yes. what ends up happening, there is somebody that wants to document their success and they've never known how to do it. Yes. They've never known how to yes. say to anybody, this is what I did. This is what it meant. And this is what it can look in the future. If you give a leader that and they can come back to the table. Um, here's all the stuff I've done the last two years. First of all, what are you going to, that it will asset to the business. Yes. But that is. accountability, people are just like these, this gives them purpose and it gives them um, uh, confidence. Right. And, yes. and, and reinforcement that they do the right things. Yes. And that's what the operating system do is they, they force ability. Yeah. And the thing you, you're spot on about accountability. It's like, this is a word that we don't even want to say because we don't want to talk about that. I can't get, or you listen to a vision. Like, no one's accountable for blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah, but whatever. But once you take the time to flip the script on accountability and go, we're just showing people what success looks like. That's right. Them. Every single time, Damon, I've, I've, I've been, I've been let down a couple times, but they weren't the right people in the right seat. If you have the right person in the right seat, accountability to them is, is incredible. Yes. Yes. Yep. I, I'm glad you brought up accountability because we had, I could, I, over the years, I can't tell you how many people have told me, oh, you know, accountability, no one seems like you're accountable. Well, did you take the time to say that, yeah. you know, and I always use the example of if I'm the person that's supposed to take the trash out in our company, mm -hmm. if I know that I have to empty 27 cat trash cans and they're all in these locations and that means a good day, it's got to be that simple for me to know that if I emptied all 27, I did what Ding. I was supposed to do and go home. It's awesome. I did great. That's it. And when we don't do that as, as vision or visionary leaders don't do that, or they don't have those things in place, those people go home wondering, wondering. did I do my job today? Yeah. Am I going to get in trouble for not doing something? It's, it's so simple. And you put, I love that analogy because it, it takes a clear, a clear, concise view of what success looks like. And that's what those operating that we talked about earlier allow is for it's for clear and, and, and unforced accountability. Because remember, we're giving these leaders a help build these things. We, it's not a top-down approach. We sit around a room with the leadership team, and we come up what success looks like together. And if you don't like what's coming up, you're encouraged to speak up and say, oh, that doesn't look like a good accountable measure. What's, so let's find something else. And mm -hmm. then by doing that, you're giving that leader the chance to buy in to what success looks like. Well, then if they don't hit the numbers or if we need to adjust them, they're involved in the conversation, not receiving the information and forcing, you know, being forced to act on it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome because I do, I do. And, and I don't make money off of EOS either. But, mm -hmm. You know, I, I just, I just think that honestly, I'll, I'll be real honest. I, I think that, you know, you know, EOS is a combination of a lot of other people's writing Absolutely. over the years in business. Absolutely. We wrote the book in 2006 and, and let's be honest, I was practicing this junk before <laughs> yeah, that. You're right. Uh, you're right. And, you know, so, but, but they've done a really good job. Yeah. Of, of, I think a really good job of, of putting it together and making it really simple. Cause you said one thing that I think it plagues visionaries is you have to understand the right people in the right spot. And, and That's one right. of the things we run it, we're, we have a client now that's they've got a full time integrator in there. Yep. And and one of the things that we've been dealing with is get it, want the capacity to do it. And everybody has to be in the right role 
They have to get what that role means. They have to, they have to have the capacity to do it and they have to want to do it. That's if right. they don't have one of those three, it doesn't matter if they've been there a long time or it's your, yeah. your buddy from high school. Right. They're in the wrong spot. They are. And, and that's the, that's where I tell people get outside perspective and I bang it over the head with them. Get outside perspective. Don't, don't just like, go get somebody else to come look under the hood. I mean, you don't work, you know, you're not, you don't work on your own teeth. You know, if you're, if you're a dentist, you don't work on your own teeth. You get somebody else to look at it. And, and business operations is no different in that. And that you sometimes, most times, all the time, need someone else to look from the outside in to say, Hey, I'm not sure this person's in the right seat. They might yeah. be the most best employee, but they may devalue or add risk to your business if you're trying to transact. Yes. And when you talk about your leadership team, you're building for an exit, it gets even more critical because Absolutely. they they have to be able to communicate that well to the to the to and deliver that value in the future. I do have a quick question and it's on topic and I, I know I don't know how much time we have, but I, I have a question for you around what is your experience around sharing information with leaders when you're preparing a business? Um, and what do you advise like your clients? How much information do you give the leadership team around an exit? Like, hey, we're prepping for exit or, no, you know, it's never, never. never. You never, never talk about it. It's you, just you not, might, it's if, not important. If, there, if, if you, you might have a, a C-level person that understands that, hey, exits in the future. Yeah. Re really. Okay. Let's, let's just back up a bit. People that are working in a business should know that that business will be for sale someday. Okay, so you think you look at, it's important to have that be some aspirational discussion from the visionary to, to yeah. the teams? It's like, listen, I'm not going to be in this business forever. I'm going to get old, first of all. That's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I'm not going to. But but we're going to have a viable business that's going to survive far past me. Right. And if they begin doing that early, the team begins to understand that the business isn't Damon or it's not mad. It's, it's really, it's the business has value right. on its own. And when you start to treat them like that, this whole thing, this whole thing is yes. You don't say, Hey, I'm, I'm actively selling the business, blah, blah, blah. Right. Cause you'll freak people out. Right. But it doesn't come as a huge surprise because people are going, yeah, it makes sense. We're rocking yeah. it. It's time for him to go. You know, yeah. we've done what they've done. So we don't, we don't generally broach the topic with people internally other than some C level people. Right. But from an inside perspective, you really don't know any difference because it's, we're trying to get consistently and incrementally better every single day, every single week, every single month, you know, just, just like you do just constantly. Yeah. 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 And, and, and gradual, it's, gradual improvement. Gradual improvement. It's like, you well, know, I asked that because it, it's, it's like, it's, I'm in an interesting spot as a fractional COO or fractional integrator. Cause I have the visionaries ear um, and I mm -hmm. have their, the, the vulnerabilities that they share and the challenges that they're coming to me with. And, and I may know in one ear that they want to sell, but the other ear I've got, I've got the, the, the leadership team talking to me and it's like, it's kind of hard for me to go, golly, we really just need to ratchet another you know, 50 basis points out of EBITDA and then we can get to that bigger multiple. Like this is how yeah. we can do it. But, but I can't always go back to the leadership team and say, Hey, we need to get another half. Of them maybe flying the coop when, when they learn yeah. he's leaving or, or whatever. So I, it's always a, something that comes up in goal setting. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, this is where if, Early on, again, like I said, business owners are honest and say, listen, I'm not going to be here forever. And then they can also start talking about the value of the business. And 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 not in terms of I've selling next week or next right. month or next year, but I'm concerned about growing the value of this business so it leaves a legacy for all of us, people right, to right. work here and beyond the business. And if you if you approach it that way and you're talking about value, you can then go into those conversations like you're saying and say, listen, we all know that Dave wants to build or, or Sue wants to build value in this business. And if we if we can get our EBITDA up by that, whatever you said, half a mm -hmm. point or whatever a point and that jumps us into a different multiple level, we're all going to look like heroes. That's right. You know, and, yep. that, and it's it, you're really it's it's 
hey, we're all going to. And I think that's one of the things that business owners are afraid to say is I do have something else that's going to happen after this. Yep. Hard yep. to admit it, too. Hard to admit yep. it. Yep. Um, but yeah, so anyway. One, one um, how are we doing on time? We good? Oh, we're good. We're good. Okay. We got five or so, 10 minutes. Somewhere. One of the things I wanted to talk about, and, and you brought it up earlier, and it's something that I find myself uh, working with a lot of clients on is this, you mentioned the right person, the right seat. Um, and this, as it relates to building the leadership team for exit, make, how, do, if we know we, you and me, the visionary know that we've got, um, a leadership issue in one of our departments. And a lot of times, um, those people are left in the business because it's just easier to keep them. How many times have you heard that? It's just easier mm -hmm. to keep them right now. They yep. share a lot of information, um, they, you know, they're the, they're the, the knowledge holder, right? They're the, they're the, yep. uh, the cog in the wheel that keeps it spinning. So yep. what I like to do is come in and be that person that says how, I, and I always tell visionaries this, I promise you, I can learn 50 to 75% of what this person's job is as a leader in 45 days or less. And, and comfortably say, if they walked out of the business tomorrow, I could assume their role for a finite period of time and give you protection and ease that we can replace this person. I know it's not going to be fun or easy, but you've hired us to come in and help build your leadership team. And what that means is it's our responsibility to help transition that person to a different seat or out of the company. Mm -hmm. So to business owners that have a, a lump in their throat, when they think about removing a person from the business and they know in their heart that they're not the right fit, get somebody to help you. Like you don't have to be the bad guy. You're the no. visionary. You're the boss. You're the C. Find somebody who's got experience in transitioning out that person mm -hmm. because you will thank yourself when you do it. Eventually it's not going to be fun in the interim, but trust mm -hmm. that most times the business isn't going to fall apart. If you transition that person out. Completely. Yeah. Yeah. And you can be compassionate about it. And honestly, yeah. and I hate, I hate to say it. Um, I do that a lot for clients. Yeah. So where we, <laughs> where we are, where, you know, we might not necessarily be the one that's learning the role and doing the transition, right. but, but making the tough decision and having the tough yeah. conversation because that outside perspective, they simply visionaries have a very hard time of doing that because of the um, things, even when they know the people are not in the right spot yeah. and the people themselves are not happy. That's right. the other thing. They're not yeah. happy. They're, they're phoning in their work. They're just not quite there. Yeah. They're holding a big salary. Most times, you know, they're yeah. one of the higher yeah. paid people and yeah. um, it's hard work, but it's work. That there are people like you and me who, um, who do it uh, respectfully and, and help, help visionaries realize that, you know, there is a better fit for that seat and it's going to add longer term value to the org and, you know, yeah. short term frustration, I bet, but long term value. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And and the other thing it does is it, it deflects the some of the if there's ill will from that change, it's not on the owner. That's right. The visionary, the visionary is not the one that gets most right. of that. And it's like, listen, they're helping me do this, that you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Taking that out because they can continue and the other internal people can continue doing That's what right. they need to do as well. It's it's really it's a key thing though. It's so key because that one person on the exit could make the difference between you selling that business or not. I mean, think about it. If if we see it, you and I see it, sir, any wise buyer is going to see that this person yeah. is being um, defensive with information. They're withholding things. They're just interested in having a conversation. I mean, man, I, what a disappointment to get all the way through diligence yeah. to have a leadership conversation with somebody that falls flat and the guy's like, or guy, this is who's running your 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 ops team. This this guy yeah. or gal that doesn't care. It's like, oh, I should have thought about that before they all sat yeah. down. And so, yeah. And the and the thing is, is it's not usually a reduction in price. It's usually a binary decision, and it's no, nah, we're gonna pass. Yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah. the thing because the 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 risk tolerance of a buyer is gradually or a seller the owner is gradually increasing over time as yep. that business gets bigger the risk is a little more over time but they're also you know if they're profitable they're they're growing that risk without much debt and or you know 
a little bit of debt here and there, it's going down, but that risk is growing over time. But when you think about the buyer, whether it's an individual or a private equity group walking in, they've just taken on that whole load of risk right there. Yep. One step, walked yep. in and took it all on. Yep. And wrote a big all check doing it. <laughs> and wrote a big check. Yeah. It wrote a big check. Yeah. yeah. And they've not run the business before. Right. They've not run that business. I don't care if you're in the same industry. I don't care if yep. they have not run that business. That's right. So so the better off you can you can mitigate these risks and do it, the better chance you have of going through it. But that that risk difference between the person that owns the business today and the buyer tomorrow is so drastically so different. different. So different. That it it you know, it might sound like what you're saying, oh, you can, you know, if I got one real strong person on my leadership team and the others aren't, it really doesn't work that way. If, yeah. if they're not going to, going to be able to hold, hold their own. That's right. So. And how many times have you heard somebody say, Oh, I like this business, but we should want anybody to run it. There's nobody to run it. Who's going to run it when the, when the leader, when the CEO steps down, the vision yeah. steps down. And that's when I say, hello, if you've got a decent leadership team, they're doing the work, they're doing yes. the work, they're doing yes. the work. They're going to run the business. Yes, and they are. That's, that's the plan. We had a guy, we had a, 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 an owner last year that almost did it textbook. I don't know how you could do it any more textbook than he did. He hired a CEO about a year and a half before his exit. He got the CEO running the company with his leadership team, running the company. The CEO was the one making the big deals. Wow. So that this, I just want to say this, the CEO that he hired was the one making the big deals. Now, the owner was out hunting, yep, finding some big opportunities, and then he would bring the CEO in and let the CEO close the big deals or just let him know that there's a big opportunity, let him close the deals. And they and he was enabling growth. And he had a couple years of nearly 100% growth. And then the third year, he had about 70% growth. And when that thing went up for sale, it was like wildfire. Ding. Yes. Yeah. And it, I mean, and it's, it, it, yeah. Intentional thought around structure. Yes. Yeah. Came down to, came down to a bidding war between two people. He walked out with almost 95% of his money at the close. Love it. And about 20% higher value. Love it. And we thought it was going to get. That's so good. Oh. And again, it's, 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 yeah. It's kind of like saying, and this just popped into my head because I'm buying a car. It's like you're getting the car facts of the, of the, of the business when you've got uh, a leadership team in there that can tell you all these things. And it's like, would you ever buy a used car without a car fax? No, you wouldn't. You'd, you'd want to know that it wasn't in an accident. It hasn't been flooded. What are these things? It's like, that's sort of what you're doing with a leadership team, right? You're yes, you're, you're putting you're putting a you know a bit of some guardrails, and some warranty, and some reassurance, and I just think it goes so overlooked. Um, and there's, I think, a lot of it has to do with ego and and ignorance. Honestly, I don't say that negatively. I just mean buyer, sellers, business owners are ignorant about what it takes to transact, and um, they need they need more direction and wisdom. And a lot of times. Um, putting their leadership team through training or, or investing in, in operating systems is, is at the front of their mind. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it's, and it's something that, that, you know, the people that have done it and seen it succeed, that's why we get so passionate about it. It's yeah. Cause it's, yeah, it's yep, true. Yep. Also, it's, you, you can't, you can't deny it. It's true. You're exactly right. You're exactly yeah. right. Matt, it has been absolutely incredible, dude. Having it. you on, it's I so much it. fun talking to you about this because you you've been there, you've helped a lot of entrepreneurs and and visionaries. Yeah. You yourself have gone through the process of building and exiting companies and and being around exits, and, and ah, man, so great to talk to you about so awesome. you know, building a leadership team for your yeah. exit. Well, I'd love to tell you for a second about what we're doing at Wolf's Edge. Um, yes, so I'm do a, that. I'm a, I'm a fractional COO, and what that means to to most people that aren't familiar is is I'm brought in by visionaries or CEOs to help essentially co-run their business, add structure and and formality. And there's 12 of us over at Wolf's Edge. Um, we are all all experienced executives, um, and we all love growing and scaling businesses. Um, and we work fractionally. So what that means is we work, you know, basically an hour. I'm sorry, a day or two a week with several different yeah. clients. 
And our goal is to get them in, in uh, you know, three, six months, nine, 12 engagements, get them in and out. And our job is, um, is, is based on our success is based on transitioning or graduating you into that. So that's what we do every day, all day. Um, and that's you awesome. Can find us online at Wolf Sedge Integrators, uh, all over LinkedIn, all over the internet. And, um, yeah, that's what we do. Yeah. The guy, you know, you, I, I, should, I always say guys and I want to just peel people, the like guys and, yeah. and gals. Yeah. It's just, folks. Lots of I great say folks. folks. There you go. There folks. you go. It's, it's, you know, at Wolf Sedge, you're doing some great work there. We've got an incredible that. team, Damon. I'm not going to yes. lie. Yes. Yes. I love it. And it's, it's so much fun when you get to talk with experienced people like yourself and the others on your team there at Wolf Sedge and, and really see the value that, that people can access if they choose to. That's right. It's exactly right. Very well yeah. said. Well, Matt, thank you for being here. I want to thank Alana. Thanks so much. You, she talked about, yes. She was talking about this when we were when we were going through the projections and how you've done. You were talking about the scorecards and the length of time. It's it's so awesome to see that. And thanks so much for being here, everyone. If you haven't uh, heard this whole thing and listen to Matt, go back to the beginning. I mean, there's some real real gold in here. He was dropping and also follow up with Matt on LinkedIn here. Matt Haney, H A N E Y, uh, and and uh, Sinclair Ventures. Just Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Love it, we'll Damon. Thanks yeah. for your work. Talk to you soon, We'll be buddy. back again next week. Take care. Mm -hmm. Hang out.